y'all. Come on. Let's try that again. Hello. 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 Didn't that sound better to y'all? That sounded better to me. How'd you feel about that, Salvatore? Was it good? Yeah, it's all right. That was uh, good. Thanks, Lowe's. <laughs> all right, it's, it's over now. Thanks. <laughs> hey, y'all. Welcome to our third session of Science Against Capitalism. Who's excited? <laughs> that sounded pretty exciting. A little spooky. Um, <laughs> so I'm super, super, super excited for our discussion today um, with two great, great, great folks. So first, we have Dr. Suzanne Pierre, who is a microbial ecologist, biogeochemist, writer, founder and lead investigator at Critical Ecologies, which is a lab, well, a non-profit non -profit, um, space for folks who have both scientific and generational knowledge who are putting it together to really fight back against oppressive systems. So we're really excited to have her here join us. Also, our great, great, great friend, Salvatore Engel de Mauro, who is a professor at SUNY New Paltz and the author of Socialist States and the Environment. So this is about to be a really wonderful discussion. So I'm really glad that you all made it out for this. And please join us again next month new information on that soon. You guys got the inside scoop um, for our next session of Science Against Capitalism. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Salvatore to lead us through. Thank you so much, Sadie. And thank you all for uh, coming uh, and um, <clears throat> for uh, attending this seminar. Uh, I can recognize some who uh, have been attending this seminar series, so I hope you can forgive the repetition. Um, I want to make sure that everybody knows, uh, first of all, that a big thanks to uh, the comrades at the People's Forum for um, allowing us this space and for organizing. Um, the seminar series is also sponsored by um, Eco-Socialist Horizons, a um, very small organization that I'm part of, and also Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, which is a journal that I edit. Well, now, um, I'll, I'll take a back seat uh, shortly, I hope. Um, but in any case, I've brought some copies for anybody who's interested in the journal. And you just take them there for free. Um, and um, I hope that uh, you will um, enjoy reading whatever the content is that you enjoy reading. And if by, uh, by any means, if, if you're interested in more articles from that journal and you don't have access, just email me. And I think my email information will be available through the People's Forum. Um, or if you're interested, I can just share my business card or something. Um, now, this seminar series, as, as the title suggests, is, um, is to d develop or to at least start um, maybe redeveloping um, a, an, an interest within um, left-wing circles in becoming part of the biophysical sciences rather than um, operating from outside uh, and just borrowing whatever is found out through the biophysical sciences. Instead, you know, as much as one can, or uh, not everybody obviously can, but um, to be involved directly in, in producing um, that kind of scientific knowledge instead. Um, so the goal is, in some respects, to get people interested in, um, as socialists, in becoming um, scientists in the STEM fields or in the biophysical sciences. Uh, and if you're already within it, to network with uh, those of us who are interested in that, if, you're in, if you agree with, uh, with this kind of goal. Um, in light of what has been discussed um, in the um, anti-war protest that was just organized, um, uh, a short while ago, um, you know, in, in a future society that is not capitalist, we'll need all the technical expertise uh, possible. And uh, in light of that, if there is going to be a change, um, I think in general there needs to be readiness for, for people to be experts in the various fields and not to sort of suddenly out of the blue say, so, oh, society's changed, now we need all these damn technical experts and they're our enemies. Um, we shouldn't be in that uh, situation. So I think the matter is, is important with respect to that. And to add to what was stated in the, um, in the, in the uh, speeches given just an hour ago or so, um, it, it is a daunting task because uh, overwhelmingly the biophysical sciences are um, oriented very much against any sort of socialism. And, um, and so as was uh, uh, described, you know, um, uh, with respect to um, the protests that, uh, and, and all the, the protest movements that emerged in the late 60s. During that time, 
um, the the majority uh, was uh, voting for the right wing or the extreme right wing, and there was no necessary sense that there would be any sort of social change uh, in the air. And yet it happened. So I think even within the sciences, even if you don't have much representation of anything uh, that is politically um, on, the, on, on the correct side, to say the least, uh, it, it still doesn't mean that there isn't a pent up frustration within the sciences that could be tapped on and, uh, and worked through and in, in, uh, in ways that could be much more constructive for a different kind of society. Now, that's in terms of those among us who are already within the biophysical sciences or are studying you know, in that respect and can perhaps blend the politics with the biophysical sciences together. Uh, otherwise, you know, helping to build connections among scientists is, is already something that would be extremely useful, and I hope that people will be interested in doing that uh, among those of us who are here, but beyond as well, in the lab, in the field, wherever um, biophysical scientists are, are involved, to get them connected to each other if they have the, this kind of um, political view or, need, or, or feel a need to develop it. Uh, the other thing, of course, is to recruit um, scientists to socialist causes, even without doing the biophysical science per se, but just to recruit them to the cause according to whatever means are available and uh, you know the specific situation that one is in. Of course, one always needs to be very careful in some respects. One, you know, the, um, there are repercussions. And if possible, of course, organize events like this in other places uh, and, and to connect with those of us here who are organizing the seminar series uh, and to report back and to share information and to uh, share also um, more resources and, and to uh, expand on what is being done here. So with all that said, um, it is a huge pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Pierre. Um, basically, uh, with respect to um, what she has been accomplishing of late is um, <laughs> To some extent, unprecedented, I think, in North America, for sure, of uh, of of trying to uh, connect um, issues of social justice um, um, with with ecological work. Well, I mean, actual scientific ecology work, which is really still rare, unfortunately. There are precedents, but uh, they're disconnected from each other, uh, but without any, um, I guess, further. Uh, introductory statements with respect to her work and what she's done, which you can view online. Um, I would like to um, perhaps start with one of the questions that we'd like to pose uh, to her, which is to give an overview of microbial ecology, which is her specialty, I, I think. <laughs> it's one, one of, one of them. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's the uh, impressive aspect. It's just one of them. Um, if you can give a, a brief overview of, of micro microbial ecology is a field study, what it addresses and how, what is its significance in today's world and what does microbial ecology, or what can microbial ecology address, what it so cannot address. Everything. Absolutely, Every in five thing. minutes. Good, good. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, no, but <laughs> exactly, the general contours. But of course, one, <laughs> the best thing would be you know, to have like a series of, of lectures to acquaint everybody with microbial ecology and also in the practice of it, but of course, yeah. <laughs> without that possibility, I guess. Yeah, we can, yeah. we can definitely do some of what you asked. <laughs> no, well, no, it's, well, it is a tall order. <laughs> and, and maybe before I start, I'm just wondering if, um, it's, it's quite a heady topic, so I, I, do we have like the bandwidth to kind of take interjections or do we want to kind of streamline it and, and take questions towards the end? I imagine they could come up. Right, and uh, I believe uh, that should be yours to decide. Oh, <laughs> I don't know about but, that. But I mean, it, 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 I'm fine either way. I think it could be good, um, but I also want to be mindful of time, so yeah. uh, that's the on my only concern okay. otherwise. Okay. What, what do you prefer? I mean, well, uh, I'll, if, if anything is super um, burning and unclear about something that I say, maybe just as a matter of clarification, I would definitely welcome clarification questions. Um, and then we'll have more of a discussion um, kind of format that's moderated at some point. And I'm looking in that direction only just to for the for the logistics of it. Do we have a mic that uh, would, would need to be? OK, Thank great. You. Thanks. Cool. Yes, I can speak like a person <laughs> in the microphone. OK, so so Thanks. you asked um, what is my so I'll start with the what is microbial ecology um, and 
ecology in general, I think everybody has some sense of this, but ecology in general is this um, under, trying to understand how living organisms um, interact with one another and the non-living or environmental components of their world. And microbial ecology is really drill, drilling down on, on that part of, of microbial life. So um, why do microbes live where they live? What are they doing there? And how does the changing environment shape um, their ability to continue living there um, and how the community functions? Um, what was your other question? Oh, sure. I mean, there's quite a lot of questions. So, um, yeah, so um, what does it address and how is, is what you already basically described? Sure. But what is the significance of microbial ecology in, in today's world? Sure. Okay. So, so I think everybody here understands that we are facing a number of crises um, across the planet. Um, they are interactive, um, but they are all kind of culminating in this idea that um, human society has shaped um, and reshaped um, the environment and how it functions in ways that are unsustainable for us to continue living as we've lived um, and for uh, non-human uh, organisms to continue doing so. And so um, there's this question about what is it exactly that humans have done to the earth? Right? Like we understand on a very high level that we've shaped um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and that's causing warming. Um, but ecologists are really trying to understand at really granular scales um, how human activities in particular have shaped, um, for example, where different species of animals are found and plants are found. Um, and that applies as well to microbes. We want to understand um, how it is that warming, um, pollution, um, and uh, industrial agriculture, and I could go on and on about the different things that society has done to change the planet, how those things have shaped um, kind of unprecedented microbial communities. So um, groupings of microbes in soil, in air, in water, on leaves, I mean, you name it, they're found there. Um, and how our activities have um, led to communities of these organisms that we've never seen um, in particular places. And again, doing particular um, uh, functional activities, right? So the interesting thing about microbes, a lot of people think of them as just kind of pathogenic. I think that's typically how we are fami like familiarized with microbes in society. Um, but the reason that I got excited about microbial ecology in the first place is that I understood or I learned um, fairly, fairly early, and cred credit to the public school system, I guess, um, that microbes are actually, um, they're kind of these extreme recyclers. They do so much work on the planet to move um, uh, elements around to to break down dead matter um, and to essentially liberate matter from one area, the living world, um, into this kind of dead world, right, of, of decomposing plants and um, uh, and so forth, and then bring that dead matter into a totally new form, um, be it uh, more soil or gas that becomes the atmosphere that we live in. And so understanding that microbes are this kind of valve like a biological valve that is can be turned off on or up doing different activities um, became so exciting to me because it meant that the controls on our environment are actually alive um, and we influence them and they change through time um, and so why is this important for uh, the kind of circumstances that we find ourselves in on um, some would say a dying planet well, because microbes are this controller, like as a community, they're this control point in the environment, um, they are not static, right? They, they respond to the ways that um, we have changed the planet. So um, the communities of microbes that we observe in all of these different environments um, are novel at this point because they're responding to temperatures the Earth has never seen before, amounts of um, fertilizers that have never been present in waterways before. And so science in, is really interested in why exactly are they there? Um, how, how is it that these new communities are coming about? And most importantly, I would argue, what are they doing differently that feeds back into environmental change? Um, for example, um, microbes, like all living things, are exchanging matter with the atmosphere and their, their environment. So microbes can actually produce CO2 themselves, right? In soils, for example, microbes are living and, and essentially breathing out, exhaling CO2. Um, but they can also take in carbon. And so they, they could be this kind of 
sequestering factor that helps mm. us to draw down carbon that's in the atmosphere, or they can end up contributing to the problem of rising greenhouse gases. So understanding who's doing what, where, is like this sort of putting on glasses into the future, right? Like we can understand a little bit more and be able to predict more. It's, a, it's, it's sort of a power. So is that a good place to pause? By all means. But scribble, that's, scribble, that's, scribble. There's, there's just so much. Um, of course, microbiology is, is not my field, but certainly well, as soon as you, you mentioned soil, it's like, yeah, yeah, my, yeah. my eyes were light up. Um, Did I answer all the questions? I'm s I think so. Um, what, cannot, what, what might microbial ecology not address, though, uh, with respect to those concerns? Yeah. Um, I mean, well, let's see, where do we start? So earlier in your kind of introductory comments, you mentioned that often science becomes used as a tool for um, the capitalist economy, like the the free, like science is on the free market. And, and what we mean by that is, yes, there's basic discovery that happens in science, but oftentimes the implications of those discoveries are most used for development of products mm -hmm. um, and tools that become, that have a price on them, right? So there's this way in which um, basic science research always kind of gets um, diverted towards the ends of of building um, a more sort of market-driven society. And the way that I think we might be able to shift that um, is by really putting a fine point on what it is that society is doing and why, and then how that then impacts microbes and how they live and what they're doing in the environment, how they are responding to humans. Um, and so maybe I'll try to clarify a little bit on that. Um, in, in ecology, we talk a lot about what scientists would describe as anthropogenic activities, right? Anthropogenic meaning human and made, right? So um, humans are driving all of these, these activities, but um, environmental scientists are not actually naming what it is that humans are doing or the motivations behind those behaviors, right? So um, when we think about uh, very simply burning fossil fuels, like driving your car and using um, fossil fuels as, as uh, a way to get from point A to point B or to warm your home, um, we describe that in science as um, just an anthropogenic disturbance, right? Within that anthropogenic disturbance is so much nuance. There's so much information that scientists have become or, or have been pretty agnostic to. They are, they're not interested in the specific ways in which something as general as that term, hu human to cause, is actually um, implicates different groups of people entirely differently. Um, who gets rich right, off of a particular anthropogenic activity? whose labor is involved in a particular act, in anthropogenic activity, um, and, and who's, what populations potentially are um, harmed or have to endure the you know, sort of side effects of an anthropogenic activity. Um, so science thus far, environmental science and ecology in particular, um, have kind of just been like, that's not our business. Um, and in fact, it is our business, and so the, I think what microbial ecology has the potential to do is shift towards really incorporating um, some of these details. And I, without rambling further, I'll, I'll stop. But I think um, there's a lot that more that can be said about why to do that and how to do that. I, for one, would love to know. <laughs> OK. I, I mean, if you have any uh, concrete examples to draw from, which I, I know you do, but. If, if that's okay. Yeah, um, well, I think, so I'm noticing that we're like going straight into the like, um, uh, pull, pulling apart the, the social and ecological and, and how that applies to, to research. But I wonder just because I know this is a really mixed audience, um, I imagine it might be helpful to just let, let folks ask any clarif, like take a mm -hmm. pause. Yeah. Um, Cause I know it's a lot. Thanks. I also have an eyelash, so I need a moment well, yeah. to myself. Anybody have a question? Microbial impact. 
Was that? <laughs> Microbes. Yeah, <impact>. exactly. <laughs> it might be that. Thanks. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, Sorry. Um, I said, a qu how, how big is the impact of like microbes on CO2 generation, uh -huh. like globally? Um, there's a, another ecologist in the audience who I'm going to uh, ask for <laughs> to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but um, micro so um, microbes in uh, soil, for example, um, produce CO2 through respiration, right? So they're um, they do the opposite of of plants. Um, they they function like us. So they're producing CO two, um, and the rate is is a significant part of um, of CO two generation. But I don't have the actual percentage on hand. But it's I, I believe it's actually like a pretty um, under warming. So I should clarify, right? In general, um, microbes uh, emitting CO two is not like this huge. Uh, contribution to the co2 that's warming the atmosphere but there's this feedback effect that happens where um, microbes are doing more respiration so producing more co2 as warming is happening so um, it's it's like a problem that we've created and that they sort of are feeding back into and that's just speaking for soils and i think that's probably true for other like aquatic respiration and so forth Oh, um, check my sources. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, after a uh, question I had like with Monsanto when they have like those soils that only grow their seeds, like does mm -hmm. what does that destroy the microbes or does that create kind of like new ones when those yeah. things happen? So I'm I I don't claim to be a, an agriculture expert, so I just want to uh, be okay. honest. With, but but I can try to answer your question still. Um, so what the speaker is referring to is. Um, like these kind of um, genetically modified seeds that are designed um, at the gene level to only grow under certain conditions that this company, Monsanto, um, can sort of control. So they have particular um, triggers, essentially, for when the, those seeds will germinate and so forth and under what conditions, um, and they often can't reproduce. Um, and that kind of is this way that the company controls who gets to grow those those plants and how much and um, and so there are a lot of problems with that. But um, there's this this issue, I guess, of uh, whether these systems that a company like agricultural systems that a company is really controlling, whether they're actually creating this bottleneck on the um, natural diversity of microbes in soil. So in nature. Um, soils are extremely diverse in terms of the composition of microbes. Um, and when we say microbes, I want to be clear, we're talking about bacteria, archaea, multicellular um, uh, microscopic organisms, um, eukaryotes, and fungi. So all of those are captured. And then within those ginormous groups, there are um, many, many, many um, sort of subgroupings. So um, that's the natural diversity that we need and expect in, in soils. And one of the kind of major areas of research is um, in ecology is how does um, the kind of monoculture of, of crops where, you know, they're, they're planting only one type of crop um, across huge swaths of land, fertilizing them in this very specific way that's kind of created by this company and so forth. Um, how does that actually narrow and narrow the community till it's, it's basically like there's only this one kind of set of microbes that exist across huge, huge um, acreage. Um, and, and this is a problem because then I think the speaker kind of points out, how does, um, does it make it so that um, only those Monsanto bred and designed plants can continue to grow there? And these are ways in which I think, it's actually a really great example, the ways in which human activities and ideologies, right, that a company should have the right to do that that they should be able to basically print genetic material and control the ownership or intellectual property of that genetic material. And that genetic material then has a consequence on the natural microbes that can grow there, right? We are, we are by extension of this idea of intellectual property, um, filtering what, can, what microbes can exist and do what they do. Um, that's kind of disturbing, um, but there's, but, so I think that's a really wonderful question that you asked. I could ramble, but I won't. Mm.
Gee, I'm getting heated. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also have a question. Um, so you you answered part of my question, which was to clarify a bit more what microbes actually are. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also curious to know the origin of microbes. Like maybe if you could take us back in history. Oh, um, I, I basically can't do that. Okay. <laughs> I love that you asked that. I'll, I'll do like a shit job of that, but um, uh, I'll try. Okay, well, maybe a more specific question is... Um, how microbes also interact with the human body and, and have in the past and yeah. um, maybe briefly just saying how they do so now in, in modern times. Mm. Yeah, um, so so uh, I'll start by saying your question about like where do microbes come from, they come from the same place that we come from. Um, we were once single-celled um, organisms and um, sort of the way, I mean, as a, as a very, like, as a very, like, coarse uh, description of how, um, like, multicellular organisms came to be, um, we understand that um, evolutionary history shows that um, single-celled organisms were the precursor to multi-celled organisms, and we are multi-celled organisms, um, eukaryotes, and so um, the way that we kind of diverged um, from single-celled organisms is that um, one, <laughs> it's funny to describe phagocytosis, it's mm -hmm. one, <laughs> one cell ate another cell. Mm -hmm. um, and that smaller cell that became part didn't become food, it became a living thing within. Um, and there's evidence for this, very good evidence, to show that um, that the this is the generation of um, cells with with organelles with with parts within the cell, and then eventually multi-celled organisms. And and I'm super simplifying that, but that's one way to think about the d departure between um, things like bacteria, which is one cell, or an archaea, which is another single-celled organism that we hear less about, but is very important um, and small, and um, and so forth. So. Um, yeah, without trying to do a, a, a evolutionary history right now, that's that's one way we can think about the origins of single versus multi-celled organisms. Um, and then you mentioned uh, how, like, asking how 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 the um, how, if I if I may if I remember correctly how um, the relation between microbial populations and the human body has changed uh, recently. Oh. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, it's not my expertise like at all. I'm not someone who thinks about the human microbiome, but my, we are, maybe there is some, you're raising your hand as though you might have an answer. Um, yeah, to add a little bit to that, going back to the agriculture, I mean, the more and more that we have these monocultures in agriculture, industrial agriculture, like in the Midwest with the Corn Belt, and these apocalypses of uh, the soil micro, uh, micro uh, biology, uh, the less and less diverse our own food becomes Correct. through processed foods. I mean, the, our own microbiota has been um, having that same kind of apocalypse of diversity. Mm -hmm. I think recently they actually, um, I, I forget what, what uh, publication I was reading, but there's beginning to uh, catalog like human uh, microbiomes. So they're going, uh, you know, the, the research is going across the world to collect samples mm -hmm. from people's intestines to catalog that because, I mean, really the consequences on our health is we, we don't know fully yet. It's like, this is like so recent, but um, I mean, you think about like uh, the importance of, yeah, the, the more processed the food is like, the less impact we have from that diversity that has impacts even on our brain health and our longevity, right. uh, upregulation from, yeah, it's, it's like unprecedented, like the impact it right. has that we don't even know about. No, no, no. 
So no, I, I, uh, perhaps we can proceed because it seems like we're actually veering to, uh, uh, which makes sense logically as well, we're veering to the next topic, which is about um, something that um, Dr. Pierre has been thinking about for a number of years and, and developing in our own work, and that is critical ecology. And uh, so I think the discussion here, perhaps I'm not sure, let me know if I'm incorrect in this, but it seems like this discussion itself is a form of critical ecology, like asking these kinds of questions. Um, but um, but how, um, how would you describe critical ecology? What inspired mm -hmm. you to develop such a framework? Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, the framework is still being developed by far, and um, work that Salvatore has done is a big part um, and inspiration of, for that. So I just want to yeah. recognize that up front Thanks. and say, um, so, so we just kind of introduced this idea of, of microbial ecology, how human activities are changing. Um, the microbial ecology of you know forest environments is, is my expertise, um, but also as the spe uh, other speaker mentioned, um, affecting human bodies um, and our microbiomes. Um, this kind of provides a, an entry point to talk about, well, why, is, uh, why has science um, chosen to kind of look at this in this in a way that does not um, involve these um, ideological backings of the the activities that are making these changes happen why is it that we have said um, in order for science to be objective um, and sort of pure or basic science we can't talk about um, the the social questions that are um, embedded in these and, and so I, I as, a, as a kind of early student in science, um, wondered this and, and brought this up with professors and so forth. And the resounding response was, well, it's, it's not objective. You're not asking um, questions that are purely driven by um, observation. But in reality, we can observe, and I think people in this room have um, observed and brought up over and over again that, um, that what we're facing on the planet at all of these different scales are caused by humans. And so not understanding um, details about how human beings have shaped these processes and where the ideas came from to do what we've done, right? To, to build this type of society that we live in, um, not engaging those questions is actually a missed opportunity for scientific rigor um, as opposed to um, a lack of objectivity. And, and so this, I, I continued to get pushback about these kinds of questions, but um, found that there's, there's no time to waste, right? Like to be in this kind of back and forth dialogue with, with those in science who would say we should be pure and objective. Um, these are also the very same people who are not at the risk end, um, the high risk end of the crises that we're facing. So it's, it comes as no surprise that these are not the intellectual priorities of those who want science to remain objective and pure. Um, and so this, uh, I started drawing from um, people in the social sciences and humanities who've done a lot of theoretical work around these questions of um, sort of how does an ideology shape a behavior and make our material world. Um, that work has been, has a long history, but it had never really been, um, you know, I think except for folks like Salvatore, have never really um, merged that with methods of going out and actually investigating and testing where those patterns um, show themselves, right, in the in the physical uh, and biological world. So, critical ecology is is just a merger of things that already existed, but had barriers because of our social apprehension to um, kind of seeing uh, discussions of power engage with discussions of our physical, our biological world. Um, and I, I say all of that to say I, I, I'm truly merging other people's ideas um, just in potentially slightly different and new ways. Um, and so I guess relating this back to microbial ecology, like what what is this, like why, right? Like I think I, I've given in the last like couple of weeks, I've given like three different talks to 
just science audience. Like I'm talking only old white men um, in a big old room, more more people than this room. And they're kind of and I, and I talk about this and their reactions are kind of their reactions are kind of like, that's nice. Um, we love justice. Um, <laughs> I'm a good guy. Um, but there um, but there's this uh, persistent sense of like, what does it do? Like, what's the point? Um, is it just this kind of exer like thought exercise? Um, and so it's it's so important for me to emphasize like what does it what does it do for what we get to know as a society, um, and and I think the first thing is um, we the first thing is that um, part of the reason that these questions have not made it into the biophysical sciences is because people like me have never been leading in the biophysical sciences. These questions would be literal no-brainers. I'm not like a, you know, uh, I'm not a genius. I'm just someone who has been living in these multiple spaces and, and seeing connections not quite being made. And so that's what I'm kind of surfacing. Um, the other side of it is that that making new knowledge, like making truth available, like sci basic scientific truth is a power play, right? Like it's part of how we assert ourselves as who's, who's able to, um, you know, be the leader in the knowledge economy. So if questions like the ones that I'm interested in, in and critical ecology is interested in are deemed not a big deal, not rigorous, not scientific, it communicates that the priorities of people like me and people who have, you know, overlapping backgrounds with me um, are also sort of fundamentally not related to the, the knowledge economy. Mm. Um, and so there's this also there's a, there's a reflexive element of this, which is who participates in the knowledge economy. So that's the like me tube, like I'm just in this little tube. And then there are kind of outer rings of 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 um, what that that action or um, that reflexive work can do in the world. Um, I hope that that makes sense. I realize that I need a visual for that. Um, there is a board I mean, if you want to. I will not get up. I will, I'll get up in like two minutes. I still need to sit down. Um, no, I, 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 I might draw this, but. Um, if it makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I, and I have some slides that might contain this too. But, mm. um, Right, so there's there's the the actual act, which itself is this kind of troubling the waters of who gets to know what and what we get to know um, being essentially a fact a function of who gets to participate, right? Like who gets access to higher education, who gets access to technical s skills, right? Um, that that is this sort of um, like cycle of re legitimizing and relegitimizing ideas. But then there's this question of what if what we think we know about microbial ecology, where, where microbes are, how they live where they live, um, and what they do to the environment um, has these kind of completely unobserved patterns mm -hmm. there, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason that they're unobserved patterns um, is because in order to detect a pattern, you have to have a sense of what you're looking for. You, you don't just look out and see like, you know, a, a very clear um, pattern that stands out to you unless you've seen it before. Um, and if the people leading microbial ecology um, have not noticed these patterns or, or brought these patterns to bear on their hypotheses, um, of course we will continue to think, oh, there's no relationship between capitalism and microbial ecology. What, that's so unscientific. Um, and so, so my work with critical ecology is um, trying to investigate whether these patterns are observable in one place under one set of conditions and whether if we look at another place experiencing similar human impacts, do we see those patterns among the microbial community there as well? And, do, and can we do it over and over again to the point where um, there, are, there are truths that we can kind of surface about when humans do certain things um, or when human beings are motivated by particular ideologies and they, those ideologies motivate behaviors in the material world, are there kind of syndromes that, that emerge among the microbes that get to live there? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's, that's just worth knowing. 
Sure. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just checking. Do you, no, do you agree? I mean, it's, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I'm trying to um, imagine um, like a comparative study of um, microbial population of uh, co-evolution with also human impacts in, in, in a way like in, let's say, among the Yanomamo, uh, you know, uh, food procuring strategies compared to like monocultures and, mm-hmm, and whether mm-hmm. that, that's what that's what kind of. Yeah, <clears throat> and I, th- I think like a comparative yeah. study is is almost the closest we we can get to making arguments about how um, certain economies, um, different economies produce different microbiomes, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, we, and whether we can find like a good control group, right? Like a natural control that um, is, is what we compare both of those different economies back against. Um, that's, that's a question that remains to be seen um, because what haven't humans touched and affected? Um, is there a true control in nature? Um, that's something that I've been, yeah, thinking about and really will affect my work as well. I'm looking forward to like reading TBD, more. TBD. Yeah, <laughs> TBD indeed. Yeah. Hopefully soon. There's a couple of questions. Um, should we just not? Should we just go for it? Okay. Certainly. Yeah, that's what I just said. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know, and I think that's... So so it's actually not that big of a problem. I think it's an overblown problem that's actually... like So the problem that I'm referring to is, um, do you need a true control? Is it actually mm-hmm. necessary to find that untouched, pristine place to say, like, this is microbes? First of all, um, microbes are constantly in flux, right? As is the environment. So to kind of claim that um, that there is a true control, even if it's uh, never been touched by humans, is a little bit false. Like what we what we actually need to compare it against is just the the sort of principles of how microbial communities function, rather than trying to find the perfect microbial community itself to be that foil. So I think what we're really looking at is how do the rules governing microbial communities in nature shift under these different conditions rather than you know i think does that make sense yeah i think the elysian field is like really consistent with existing yeah yeah you also had a question um, a few, one comment wait really quick really quick one uh, wait sorry we have folks online so we want them to hear too where's the person oh okay I'm sorry the pole was left and yeah so we have folks online <laughs> <laughs> One, I, I just wanted to, I'm just affirming you, I, I went through environmental science training and the same thing of like trying to talk about urban ag and ask all these social questions and it's very much like has to be objective empirical <laughs> science or you're not respected in the same way, which is, is a bummer, number one. Number two, I'm super curious like if you're using mapping and GIS for your questions. And number three, I'm curious about like digging into the questions you're asking a little bit more. So like would you be saying like, in a brownfield in this city, this city, this city, this far from water is what's happening in the microbial community that happens to have these type of communities right around it? Or what's an example of a type of question you're asking and what scale are you looking at? Are you looking at like a couple of cities or what? So curious about the the framework of your questions. And thank you for being here. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for your questions. I appreciate them. Um, yeah, so uh, like the first question that um, you asked was about, uh, sorry, I was like focused on your last question. I forgot your first question. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, basically I'll, I'll try to answer both at the same time. Um, so these questions are inherently spatial. So, and so absolutely, um, we are using GIS as one of many tools to kind of visualize and detect those patterns, um, that, uh, that can can be surfaced as a result of using all a shit ton of data like to use a technical um sort of scaling (laughs) we have a lot of information already like a lot of the questions and hypotheses that that i'm putting forward and i'll i'll answer your question of what's an example of what we're doing and how um 
there's a lot of information that's already been collected and stored and archived, right? And it's some of it is available freely online, publicly. Um, and it's also got geographical coordinate information associated with it. So what the speaker is really talking about is how do we, um, like, do we and, and should we be um, thinking about this, uh, these questions as being um, relevant to like a, sp a spatial extent or looking for patterns across geography. Um, and I think a lot of people in this room think about like space and, and how um, you know, differences across landscapes affect these patterns and where microbes are and what they're doing. So 100% um, um, we are. And, uh, and one of the geographies, so you asked like, what is the spatial scale, right? Like, these questions could be asked at many spatial scales, but the spatial scale that's most important to, to me um, to ask like the particular questions that we're addressing in Critical Ecology Lab are at the regional and global scales. So the reason that I think a lot of the work that, and, and please please jump in, because I'm like saying a lot. No, um, I'm, I'm we, listening, I'm, I'm <laughs> learning. <laughs> we, like a lot of work that has been both environmental and social or ecological and social has been on relatively limited scale, smaller scales. Right. So um, at the scale of a city or looking at a region, an agricultural region, um, and and rarely, I think, does it go to the regional, continental, or global scales. Mm. Um, and that's, I think, because uh, uh, science, sort of um, natural science and technical science, has been separate from these questions for so long. If it hadn't been, maybe we would be scaling up to, to these larger scales. Um, but so one of the questions that um, we're addressing in my group is looking at how, um, asking this question, how did the plantation scape, so mm -hmm. the spatial footprint of slave-driven plantations in the Americas, the Caribbean, Latin America, um, shape a unique a, a, a soil and um, vegetation scape that is unique um, compared to areas that were never um, used as plantations. And the idea that we're trying to pursue here is that we know there's a very clear like spatial delineation of where were the plantations. We have excellent records of this. Um, the col colonists made sure of that. Um, we have extremely good records about what was being grown, how many people were used as tools to transform ecosystems, and we understand the duration of that disturbance and so forth. So we we have all of this information that would be would be considered really not important. If you were, for example, an ecologist, um, as many are, who are, are studying the tropics, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to understand what's going on with biodiversity and biodiversity hotspots and species loss. Well, those species are often living in secondary forests that replaced a plantation. Mm -hmm. And that's true across the Americas. And so that's a geographic question. Um, but it's also, um, it's a local question in that all of the islands, for example, in the Caribbean, um, have some shared but also different geologic history, right? So what grows back on a plantation is gonna be different because of that different parent material. So there's, it's necessary to look at this bigger scale because if you just looked at, for example, where we're starting this project in the US Virgin Islands, uh, St. Croix, um, you might be seeing patterns that are really unique to the limestone geography that's, that, that characterizes that island. And you might see some a different pattern and if you just looked at Puerto Rico. And you might say, well, they weren't the same and both were uh, you know, plantation islands. Um, and so the, you know, there's not really a pattern here as far as claiming that there's a unique microbial ecology relevant to um, European plantations. But if you zoom out further and actually look at enough different types of geologic um, parent materials, um, you get a, more of an average, right? And then you can say, is this average across all of these different um, planted um, plant, post-plantation spaces different from never planted um, spaces? So, so that's kind of the necessity of scale. Sorry, I'm taking notes because this is really interesting from, from my perspective as well, because it's something that we, I mean, in the soil science is also used to understand the variation of soil types. 
So absolutely. Uh, there's a question uh, in the back. Sorry, um, that question made me think of something. I'm humanities, so I might be in the complete different direction. It's okay. Um, but I was wondering if you would pose any questions that are more geopolitical or related to culture, um, like the differences between like monoculture, like um, like geography, like they're made for production, like the plantation scene, mm -hmm. um, or versus like the Andes or like the uh, marshes in like southern Louisiana, and how like those different um, biomes would look mm -hmm. like on the microbio um, biome scale. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you do you want to respond to that? No, no, please. Oh. I, um, I'm going to try to repeat the question, um, mm. and you can correct me if I misunderstood. Sorry. Um, so you're you're asking if uh, there's um, whether I could use geopolitics or culture as um, sort of a jumping off point to ask um, questions about how different uh, types of ecosystems, like you mentioned, wetlands versus um, another another type of um, land ecosystem, whether uh, there's differences in in the microbial ecology because of sort of cultural histories. Yeah, because the things seem uninhabitable by colonizers and how that plays a role. Mm -hmm. in the development of the land. Mm. Oh, that's a fantastic question. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad I clarified. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, this is this is like also like all work that we're working on right now. So I just want to be clear, like if you Google it and you're like, she didn't actually do that, it's because it's not published yet, um, relax. <laughs> but um, but we're getting there. And and the question that you're asking is, is absolutely the other side of um, this question of the plantation scape. So, um, so the, the project that I'm talking about is called the Ecological Scars of Plantation Slavery. It's one of um, a couple of different projects that we have in, in my group, but um, it includes both this question of like, what is the sort of ecological signature of the plantation, including microbes, including vegetation, including physical soil characteristics. Um, but the other side of it is, what is the sort of ecological footprint of the fugitivity space, where people who um, escaped from captivity and escaped from these systems went to specific ecosystems that you referred to that were seen as wasteland, were seen as um, inaccessible to, and or not useful for plantations um, for various physical reasons, right, landscape reasons. Um, and do these do these areas actually remain um, sort of hotspots of ecological function because they were um, considered sort of no man's land or maroon land? And in the case of um, St. Croix, um, there are these some of the oldest growth forests that remain on the land, which is very small, a very small area, um, are also have names like Maroon Ridge, um, were these sites where um, escaped communities lived and slave catchers tried to go to and could not, um, and to this day remain biodiversity hotspots, but that hotspot nature does not get connected with the fact that there's this particular re relevance to enslavement and labor that happened on these islands. And this is true on Puerto Rico as well and, and other islands. So um, you mentioned uh, in the US, for example, wetlands are, are like that. They've been drained for development and so forth, but some remain intact and were these areas where um, uh, uh, escaped enslaved people and indigenous people actually found kinship in a lot of cases and and learned the ecosystem and became naturalists in order to survive and they remain hotspots. Um, so so in Maroon Ridge is one place that we're looking at as this kind of um, comparative spot for um, thinking about what does fug fugitivity and um, land that is considered un impassable or useless um, look like it, when we think of the the global uh, biodiversity um, priorities, right? Like one of the UN development goals is to like preserve species and biodiversity. Well, what if actually there is an unseen pattern there where land that was um, uh, preferred and used by people who were escaping um, uh, slavery um, overlaps with the, the footprint of biodiversity hotspots that we want to protect today? Um, and you know what does that mean for conservation? Um, and yeah, I, I'm not going to keep going. What does that mean for? Digital? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but there are signif- there's certainly significance. So, I mean, to also to development of soils as you're also investigating. So I'm, I'm going to be... <laughs> I, yeah, I need to... Chat. Please, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> because actually that was something that I've been wanting to do is to study the effects of marooning in terms of soil development. Um, mm-hmm. Because I would suspect that there, there would be... Because they would be outside of the plantation systems... And also later on the mono the monocropping um, um, agro ecosystems that you would possibly have higher amounts of organic matter build sure. up and things of that nature, Absolutely. which has been found in terms of black earth in yes. West Africa and yeah. Amazonia. So yeah, it's so cool. You know, yeah. yeah. But I never I would never be able to imagine a, a microbiome um, signature because I, I just don't know about well, microbiome. Well, we'll chat about it and then exactly. you will. Exactly. Yeah. yeah okay. oh, so I'm ready to learn. <laughs> <laughs> There's, you know, th- this it seems. Th- that this also, like, if by by d- uh, develop, developing all these uh, understandings here, you're sort of uh, giving us some ideas of how uh, how you you became a critical ecologist. Um, and then, I mean, if you are, are willing to share that, yeah. um, if I could <laughs> go further as well and hit it. Uh, well, what kind of paths would you recommend for for anyone mm-hmm. interested among us? To become a critical ecologist, w- of course, you know, uh, in, with with uh, the fact in mind that not everybody will have necessarily access to becoming an ecologist in the first place. But you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I because I don't want to forget. I'm just going to respond to the last part for, yeah, first, yeah. which is to say um, that the point of critical ecology is not only to like give ecologists a framework um, to mm. ask you know, science questions differently in order to sort of pull out patterns that we're not seeing. It's also to give society an understanding of how our story fits into the actual physical world we live in. Because there's there's not really, coming from ecology or environmental science, there's no cohesive narrative that is being presented to society. Like, we're just like, oh man, we really, really messed up here. Mm-hmm. Um, but but we're not going, this is how these ideas led to these behaviors, led to these predicaments. Mm-hmm. And therefore, we're, we're just kind of bumbling around and letting people like ask for carbon credits. Like, <laughs> I'm <Exactly>. sorry, what? <laughs> like, get it together. Like, part of this is like a get it together activity <laughs> of just like, I think we need a story that makes sense. And part of that story is the framing of the questions and then the other part of the story is like what we actually find out. Um, and so it, you don't have to become an ecologist to be interested in the utility of this framework. And when you have conversations with people, whether you're a scientist or not, whether you're anything, you can frame your questions about the changes that we're seeing in the planet, right? I'm coming from Oakland, California, where it's a problem. Like we, we're getting too much rain. Um, and, and it's just like, gee, we're just getting too much rain. And it's like, well, if we could have intelligent conversations about how this relates to how our society operates, how our, our economy operates, um, I think people will feel a little bit more empowered mm. um, just having that like mental tool. Um, how did I become a critical ecologist? Is that the question? Yeah, and before you get to that, because yeah. um, that, that reminds me yeah. that we have so many models of um, human being within ecosystems that are much more constructive, even in the present, that oftentimes I have to remind, like sometimes my students, like, well, you know, it's not the case that people just ruin the land. You can see plenty of examples of people who actually make e- ecosystems better through ha- being in greater numbers, and it depends on how they do things. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just <laughs> I, I completely me agree. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I think you make a good point of bringing up like there's there's a generation of of students trying to do be part of this work and and make sense of the world that they were born into, mm. and I don't I don't think that we're doing them any sort of service by not providing a more um, clear investigative framework mm-hmm. for for doing that. So. Um, uh, I, 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 uh, several of my family and friends are in the room today, so it's funny because um, I feel like they've seen me do all sorts of things, um, and it all sort of en- ended up in what I'm describing as critical ecology. Um, but I think uh, it sort of started from this I- 
I mean, if we go way, way back, which is maybe irrelevant, I don't know. Hmm. Um, starting as like a, a young person who is just very preoccupied with the idea that the world is very unfair and that that's just unacceptable. And then sort of figuring out that um, I was really interested in the particular way that um, injustice and unevenness in society is uh, has these kind of like parallels with environmental problems. And so I discovered this world of kind of like political ecology is one kind of field that's more of a social science that's asking some of these questions. And I understood, okay, well, people are saying, look, like when when there's unevenness or or dyna power dynamics playing out in nature, we can observe that. But they weren't doing investigations. They were just sort of doing case studies in this society and case studies in that neighborhood and so forth. And it was interesting. But at the same time, like I'm at this point, I may be in college um, and I was thinking, OK, that's very good. But I don't think that we can do a lot with this. And time is running out. <laughs> and I think I just became like preoccupied with this idea that um, in order to in order to, like I said in the beginning, do this kind of work of redistributing who has the power to inform mm -hmm. the priorities of science, which is like insane. Like I, first of all, did not know any scientists. I don't I still like, you know, don't come from that sort of background. So it's not like I was um, around people who were um, like making a job out of this. But I was like, if our material world is so deeply influenced by um, kind of the scientific method and research and so forth, and if there are a bunch of people just squabbling amongst themselves about socialism <laughs> and not talking about um, or engaging with these people who are um, empowered with the actual tools to do, you know, empirical study, mm. um, like people like me are going to be screwed. Mm -hmm. And that's just unacceptable. And so then I switched majors. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went into um, environmental studies with a major or a minor in environmental biology and you know, still that was like, had a, a good amount of social science in there. Um, but I, yeah, I, I feel like I'm going uh, too far into the details. How do I get out of the weeds? Um, oh, yeah. Then I went to, then I then I decided to get a PhD. <laughs> and that's what happened. Well, how did that click? <laughs> that's what I, uh, I think those weeds are very, are, are wonderful. Um, okay. and, and possibly ra rather important. In terms also of, of a wider question of, what kind of paths would you recommend if people want to undergo this process, you know, and become critical ecologists? I mean, you're setting yeah. an example, and I, I suppose at some point something clicked through the PhD process in terms of how you're going to go about it. I don't know if that makes sense, yeah. or if that's not how it happened. No, that's pretty, that's relevant, that's definitely there. Oh. <laughs> um, I think, uh, well, I don't think everyone needs to be a scientist or a, a practicing like formally trained scientist i think we are actually all scientists is like the gag is um and so people should be like more empowered to ask questions and do different levels of study and engage with with scholars and and i think that it's like a crime that that's not how science works and by golly <laughs> i'll change it um and i think that uh to be so so the way that I've conceived of critical ecology like I'm doing it the way that works for me which is as a science mm. but um but as I said before I think people can apply a, a framework a thought framework of critical ecology in a lot of places um and and I'm I don't have a roadmap but I know that um understanding uh all of the sort of like having a decent understanding of some of the different thought lineages that you know um, inspire your work, inspire my work, um, and having at least this basic understanding of of some core ways that um, that the environment is changing in response to human choices, mm -hmm. and being able to hold those um, those kind of key points in conversation when you enter other as an educator as a um, policymaker, as a, a, a community organizer like being able to have some of those no, like pieces of knowledge and language um, is maybe how other people who don't want to go become a scientist use critical ecology in their normal lives um, hopefully to good effect uh, there was another question 
I'm, I'm not sure, oh. uh, except, um, the, I mean, for someone who, I mean, it's connected to what you already stated, mm -hmm. um, but for someone who is just starting out, what would you recommend? Mm. Yeah. Um. And of course, if I asked myself that, that same question, I'd be stumped. So. Yeah, this is hard. <laughs> is. Uh, I sent you one paper, now you want me to answer it? <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, I um. The, because I, I I'm I'm thinking, do I say the the title of a paper or like a book, mm. or do I say something else? I I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I think. You can come at this from a lot of different angles. Mm -hmm. um, for me, <laughs> the one interesting entry point um, was looking at a diagram of the nitrogen cycle. Now, I don't oh. recommend anyone do this. Oh, but it unless, is fun. Unless you, yeah, <laughs> unless you're just like Google, Google. <laughs> and you get to see um, how interconnected and, and porous our world is. And I think that that is essentially what um, my my sort of other major field of study, um, biogeochemistry, is is understanding how different parts of the environment exchange matter. In one case, you could think of nitrogen or carbon and so on. But understanding that um, the and and looking deeply into the fact that the way that capitalism is set up is is so that we have this. Um, we, we have a mental trick that we do that allows us to think that things just go places, they go away. Mm -hmm. um, and biogeochemistry is like, um, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> no, they don't. And in fact, there's, we can look at, and we can actually follow where they go. Like we can trace the impacts of our activities, even sometimes to the point of knowing their original, their origin. Um, and, and so, this means that we actually have this forensic tool in undoing some of what capitalism has done to us. Mm. Um, we have a series of, of methods that like our, our straight up CSI level, what happened here? And I think it's, it's, um, it's worth like thinking about, yeah, it's worth thinking about um, readings like re relevant to the externalities of capitalism. Mm and looking at a picture of the nitrogen cycle <laughs> maybe i don't know that's a bad answer i think it well it's wonderful for me because now i mean i've always insisted on my students learning the nitrogen cycle and i have additional you know reasons to <laughs> multiple <laughs> reasons exactly yeah. thanks <laughs> but if you've um unless you would like to add some more to that no i mean if there are questions oh. or if you want to wherever you want to go with it Um, in the front. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering related to the um, You basically answered it, but I was wondering if you, this is kind of like a question with an uh, assumption behind it, but cool. if, um, if you thought, and maybe this is personal to you, if uh, microbial studies somehow lend themselves more to critical ecology than other like larger multicellular organism studies, and if they're like if it's taken more legitimately somehow in the in oh, your that's field. That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, so the speaker, I, I think everybody heard, right? So I think um, there, the study of microbes and, and really, like, I, I want to be clear, like, there are some microbial ecologists who straight up study, like, the microbes themselves, like, individual, like, f the physiology of individual microbes, which is relevant to microbial ecology in general, but is, is actually more microbiology. And then there are people who study kind of microbial ecology, like who lives where, blah, blah, blah. And then there are people who kind of bridge the gap between microbial ecology and biogeochemistry. So basically, what do microbes do to make elements recycle? How is that changing under changing um, environmental conditions? So I think microbial ecology is useful for this question of like, power and the influence of capitalist and other sort of harmful or supremacist ideologies that have impacted the environment because microbes are at the very bottom of the food web. Mm. Like, 
legit the bottom. So everything else that you're kind of looking at is symptoms, symptoms. And it's like, I think that when we, we get down to the actual, I mean, I, I say this like sometimes like microbes, like people say like gut microbiome, like actually the microbiome is the earth's gut. Mm. And so if you want to understand what's happening to everything else in the environment, you do need to understand the regulatory processes, like literally the on off valves of carbon. And that's what they are. Um, right next to microbes are uh, plants. And I think plants are, they're also a big area of study for me. Um, so looking at the base of the food web is a powerful way to start to make like bold claims about what's going on. Yeah, I don't think it's more legit or anything though. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I was, my assumption, I'm coming also from like the worst environmental studies, um, is that like studies of animals or ecosystems have kind of been like diluted and delegitimized mm -hmm. in some way, like mm -hmm. kind of belittled, like mm -hmm. not as, I don't know, the, just hearing the word like microbiology makes me think of like this pandemic, like serious issue. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, I think that that's that's fair. Like there's some sciences that get a level of like rigor attached to them that other sciences don't because they're just it's just kind of like, oh, you're just like curious about where those birds are migrating. And it's like, no, that's very important. Um, yeah. So I totally hear that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, Dr. Pierre. Um, I first want to say thank you for um, coming to the People's Forum. It's definitely great and an honor, and I really have learned a lot um, from from your talks. Um, I was wondering if you could drill a little bit into, you know, um, trying to use critical ecology as a framework and lens as it relates to, you know, our current um, practice of the science and, you know, how can we recruit? How can we, you know, make, make projects and have, you know, the science kind of pivot, you know, towards. Um, I don't know if it's going to be investigations or through applications because I'm thinking, for example, you know, um, if I'm going to be a scientist and I want to collaborate with a fellow scientist who is sympathetic about, you know, critical ecology, but let's say the scientist also works at the National Park Service in the government and, you know, the NPS has a racist and colonial history and they're still under the U.S. government, you know, yeah. how would, what kind of tactics or approaches, you know, would be needed to, um, you know, so collaborate and do science from like a critical ecology lens. Do we have to work into institutions? Do we work outside it? Should we be overt in like the intentions? Um, just wanted your take on any of this. Um, be overt. Um, so I mentioned like a little bit earlier, I I recently gave a bunch of, uh, 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 Salvatore was one at, at one of these meetings where we were just in a room with a lot of people who had never even, I'm not saying like they've never thought about critical ecology. I'm saying they've never even thought about white supremacy mm -hmm. as being like a relevant topic to what they study. They've never thought about like capitalism as being relevant. They're just kind of like, mm, those fossil fuels, man. Um, and just completely have never thought about their relationship to the economy and so mm -hmm. forth. And so um, those people, it's a mixed bag, right? But we don't get anywhere by obfuscating what we actually are saying. We actually do people like, you know, other researchers and just various, you know, just peers um, in society a disservice by like kind of palate making things palatable um, because you, you don't give them the opportunity to reject it. You presume that they will reject it. Um, and I think giving people the opportunity to be uncertain or or uncomfortable is part of being a real player in the knowledge making economy. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't like, uh, I actually haven't had that much of a problem with um, finding people who are scientists or even work for EPA or, or National Park Service who are interested in this because people are people. Like, yes, they work for systems and yes, those systems have like ideologies and histories, but these individuals who are, you know, staff at the in these different places, um, they have their own personal histories that make them sympathetic or or implicated and they see that, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think finding people like, you know, the, the example you gave of you find a colleague and the colleague is like, I'm I'm into this, but like I don't know how. Like it's actually just an opportunity to find the appropriate 
kind of weak points in the frameworks of of capitalism and all the things that underlie capitalism, all of the supremacies that underlie capitalism. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. You asked some other stuff too, but I don't think I can answer it all right now. Thank you though. I think there was a question all the way in the back. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, thank you so much again for speaking and coming to speak to us. Um, my question kind of arose while think you know thinking while you're speaking about like what Ruth Wilson Gilmore says really often, which is like capitalism saves capitalism from capitalism. <laughs> uh, and one of the biggest problems right now is like as discussed is like the ecological problems, and bioremediation has become. I mean. Capitalism saving grace. It's like, oh, we're gonna find a microbe that can take all the CO2 out of the world and oh, put it somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> or, <laughs> um, you know, whatever the case, like we're going to use bi uh, bioremediation to remove radioactivity, heavy metals, wh whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is, how does the framework of critical ecology antagonize against like these reductionist understandings mm -hmm. of like bioremediation processes mm -hmm. uh yeah mm -hmm. so um oh man that's a great question yeah it's a very very good question <laughs> and it's something that i've had actually like good conversations about lately so i'm, I'm hot for it don't worry yes. um and i think that i would really love to hear oh. um salvatore's uh oh, i've got an axe to grind with bioremediation but <laughs> i mean so i would even take what you said about um like bioremediation being this like panacea for um, environmental problems and zoom out in, and you could put other things in that under that umbrella right like you could put um, I mentioned like carbon credits uh, so cap and trade where um, companies are essentially allowed to do more pollution and more harm if they buy like seedlings in the Amazon and they get planted and like check 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 we're done um, and so there are all of these, and there, and and I think really what your point is is underpinning all of these logics um, that capitalism has come up with that use science, like use science that has been produced thus far to create an escape hatch for itself, mm -hmm. to um, legitimize a, a maybe slightly modified business as usual, as well as. Um, kind of create this hope narrative that that anesthetizes us normies from acting out right and so <laughs> it's um, this really it's a multi-pronged weapon that um, or tool maybe that that I agree with you that is being used um, and science uh, and so we when we think about okay so so capitalism cause these problems I'm just doing I'm, I'm reiterating your point not to make like be redundant, but to make sure everybody's on the same page. Because I think this is actually one of the most important things, um, especially for people who are outside of academia, which is the most that you get to hear about the basic science is the cures. Mm -hmm. And we get information about the cures and being like, don't worry, there's science. And there's like someone holding a test tube looking at it. It's like, <laughs> have raise your hand if you ever looked into a test tube. That is not how you do science. Um, but it's like, don't worry, right? And And I think that um, critical ecology is meant to say that fundamental to the process of of generating this kind of the, the Anthropocene, right? The, the time and place that we are where humans have altered the earth in irreparable ways, that coupled to that is harm, right? At the root of these series of decisions that got made to, to legitimize things like the transatlantic slave trade, like the colonization of the Americas, like the development of, of um, like the Homestead Act, like the uh, all of these sort of expansionist ideologies that got us right here um, is the, the harm that had to be required, that was required um, and had to be justified to, to let that happen. And so if, if critical ecology is interrogating the sort of duration of that harm as it relates to the environmental changes that have happened, it becomes extremely uh, uh, challenging, I think, to continue to say 
that the ideologies that we've operated with, which have very clearly produced these environmental syndromes, um, are should continue to be the ideologies that we we allow to dictate cap and trade systems and allow to dictate bioremediation efforts. Um, and and I, I get a lot of sort of pushback from people who are like, isn't it a both and? Don't we need to do remediation and cap and trade and all these like greening the economy things while doing critical ecology? And, and my answer is like, you can, I'm not gonna stop you. Um, but what I will do is hopefully put tools, in, intellectual tools in people's hands to do enough work that makes it so that there's kind of this, um, yeah, critical mass or or a tipping point in um, actually regular people are not going to stand for that anymore. Like it's it's actually no longer um, feasible for you to kind of glaze over the fact that um, this is a this is an escape hatch for for capitalism. Um, I can keep rambling about that. I'm very this is a very serious area for mm -hmm. me. So I think it's a great question. Yeah, no, but please, I don't think he's rambling at all. <laughs> Uh, there, there's a lot. There's a lot that needs to be said. I mean, we could have an entire seminar devoted to bioremediation alone, probably. I think I'll add one thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, how, like, um, <clears throat> one sec, one sec. Hold on. Oh wow! There's a lot of excitement. <laughs> exactly. Well, lot that's of what. That's here. what's. Uh, People won't take it anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're standing up today. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, don't don't destroy the people's forum. Don't do that. <laughs> um, so so what I I think this is um, very the the question of why bioremediation is so problematic and what we need to do to like intervene on that is related to what we can draw from Black feminist theory. Hmm. I think that the. Um, one of the salient kind of thoughts across black feminist thinkers and writers, um, like a shared point, um, is that the bodies of black women have absorbed the majority of the harm of the world, right? Both literally in terms of like physical impacts, as well as in, in kind of where they are stationed, they are stationed in life, right? Um, and when when I think about um, bioremediation, I, it's kind of this, um, I'm just kind of putting this to words right now, but like, it's kind of this thing that puts a Band-Aid on the places, like the environmental spaces that, that have been um, the, the kind of corollary recipients of that harm. And so the way that black women have theorized about their own oppression through time and kind of explained the like machinations that have made it so that um, that they have kind of accepted those burdens, um, not, not accepted willingly, but but have had to have been the recipients given white supremacy um, is a similar framework that we can think about the sites of bioremediation. Like yeah. what can we actually learn from these sites and is it is remediating like and to what end do we remediate them? Um, like when we think of and I'm really just because I'm just thinking about this, this this could be like kind of half baked. So like, you know, don't write it down. Um, just think about it. Um, there's this kind of. A, a coupled um, thinking or like tendency in the sort of social realm of of um, where black women have thought about themselves in society and where sites of bioremediation have to happen is that um, that there's no kind of redress um, that that they get about their situation. There's sort of this. Um, let me think about this more. I, I don't want to. I don't want to kind of spill the beans before the beans are really good. But um, I'll get. I'll get back to you on this. You want to sure. riff a little bit? Well, I mean, <laughs> much more more superficially than I. <laughs> I mean, um, I was trying. No, no. I mean, these are profound questions that you're raising that um, I need to think about as well. Um, I was thinking more like in just even in, 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 on its own terms. 
you know what people come up with uh, in terms of vibration are incredible by the way i mean you should see like the details of it um what the, what some of these folks are thinking up i'm not, i don't mean like the policymakers have no clue uh, for the most part I, I mean the the actual scientists who are doing the work and i mean for example extracting copper out of um um a devastated landscape you know through uh, using plants and then you, uh, you 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 harvest the plants and then you have copper ingots I think that's wow that's really amazing but uh, so why are you doing this um, when you know fully well that the price of copper oscillates so wildly oftentimes that is you're not going to even be able to use that copper and wouldn't it be nicer if that copper were available to anybody that needs it um, right redistribution of wealth so to speak and that's not what all this incredible knowledge is being put towards so even on technical terms what could question bioremediation for instance as well, you know, there's um, a whole bunch of urban areas where you could you could certainly produce quite a bit of uh, produce at the very least, but oftentimes are very contaminated, and people think, oh, we're just going to remediate these sites. I'm saying, so, oh, hold on a second, mm -hmm. um, where are you going to put the remediated plants? You know, or the the the, the ash, <coughs> or you know, the, or the, the the trees, the fast growing trees, or whatever plants. Where are you going to put them? They're, they're actually going to be like hazardous waste. Mm -hmm. Are you going to contaminate somebody else with it? So all these things, you know, it, it's like. That's why I like very much how you uh, describe biogeochemical cycles as like showing say. you you can't just shove this stuff under the carpet and forget about it. Mm -hmm. That's not how things work. Yeah. And that's and, and in a capitalist system we're <laughs> sort of misdirected into believing that nonsense. And and that I think again, science tends to and, and historically always has just been co-opted by that project mm -hmm. um, and so one of the ways that I hope um, yeah I, I'm still stuck on this this connection between um, kind of how black feminists have theorized um, kind of the structure of society and the logics that sort of perpetuate the position of the black woman and, the, and really that that the position of black women globally can can be this kind of mirror for understanding everything else that's happening and i'm thinking about how sites that are so polluted that you can't grow anything there mm -hmm. sites that are so polluted that humans can't live there mm -hmm. that um you know organisms that should be able to thrive there can't um are are they that that lens as well or, or that kind of a mirror um to kind of turn turn our gaze back on the sort of structures that made that space what it is mm. because there's no there's there is no compartmentalization they're sort of one exists only because the other exists mm. right. um and the same is true for mm. um anti-blackness and um and misogynoir and um and white supremacy like one cannot exist without the other and so um yeah, um, they're not, I think one of the things that science can do for us in thinking about our society is like popping the bubble of thinking that um, there's an us and there's a them. Mm. Like you only exist the way that you get to exist because there is there is an equal and opposite. Mm. Um, and unless we reckon with that, we're just doing it in different formats again and again. Exactly, dialectical materialism. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, I can't help myself. Um, no, that that was that's yeah. Uh, there was a question here as well, and I end another one. Okay, great. Hi, um, you explain part of the work of the critical ecology as inviting people who wouldn't think of themselves as knowledge producers into the space of producing knowledge. So my question is, um, like. What would that system look like mm -hmm. in some like practical tactic sense? Mm -hmm. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about the structure of your lab within critical ecology sure. and, and how that may achieve some of those goals. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm trying to. I also have like some slides, and I'm like, when to do them? Like, is it maybe it's helpful? Uh, maybe not. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll answer your the first question. Um, so what what practically can what what practically would it look like to to sort of 
democratize, for lack of a better term, the, mm -hmm. the process of coming up with new scientific questions. And, and like, let's focus narrowly on ecology as like one of those many spaces where that could be happening. Um, so, so the lab, um, the critical ecology lab is doing this by, um, I mean, trying to do this. So I'm going to say really quick, like these are, these are questions and, um, and we're kind of experimenting with different models for this. One model um, that we are piloting this year, 2023, um, is sort of what does it look like to host spaces for people in communities? Um, and in this case, we're focusing on the San Francisco Bay Area and um, mm. Oakland in particular. What would it look like to bring people with shared uh, identity and heritage together to ask so sort of these spatial and temporal questions through the lens of their own ancestry and sort of past as well as their present and futures. Um, and so I'll, I'll give an example to kind of make that make more sense. So we're interested in, we're hosting these, this series of events, um, sort of community convenings between um, uh, sort of a partnership between um, different Bay Area, um, black diaspora uh, led and serving organizations. Um, so we're focusing on the African diaspora in particular um, solely because of this idea that people's um, sort of ancestral memories, shared ancestral memories, can be this um, source of generating questions about how the environment has changed in tandem with the kind of shared understanding of how who we are and where we how we got here. And of course, the Black diaspora is extremely multifaceted, and and, and I don't aim to create a monolith by bringing um, or focusing on Black people in the Bay Area. What I aim to do is create a space that wouldn't be available otherwise and then bring in scientists with shared histories. So the very few black and brown scientists that I know um, who are focused on ecology, microbial plant and, and so forth, and bring them in as listeners. And so hosting these kinds of community events where we, we offer a meal and a shared kind of um, breaking bread space. Um, we engage in some um, media that my lab is generating like short films. Um, to kind of prompt questions about um, points at which our our heritage, our history, uh, social history, and the environmental change that we're concerned with intersect, and notice where um, those those intersections might lead to a question, and then our partners who are these scientists. Um, can be in conversation and say, well, what would that look if we tested it? Well, how does that become a testable hypothesis? Okay, now we are taking that event series and, and making it um, a set of, of proposal writing um, initiatives where community members from these same cohorts are welcome to be par authors on grants that we write to ask for the resources to, to study these questions. Um, and we want to do this iteratively and across the country. Um, so knock on, I, I don't know if this is wood, but. Probably not. Um, we, I, I aim to test this in other communities as well. And and I have a lot of thoughts about what a community is and whether that word means nothing mm. um, at this point, but, um, but maybe it means something still and maybe I'll find out through this series. <laughs> so it's like one model. Oh, and then you said talk about the sort of lab in general. Um, I don't want to eat. Uh, you can you can learn a little bit more on our website, um, criticalecologylab.org. Um, but I'll just say uh, quickly that there's a lot of reasons that it exists, um, but the main ones are um, that I wasn't interested in kind of wrestling with what science wasn't comfortable with me doing anymore, mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to create an alternative space that truly stepped away from kind of the ivory tower model. Um, and in that way could be a handshake of trust with these communities that are like, why should we trust academia? I'm sorry, you've only screwed me over. Um, and maybe not to say that the nonprofit kind of industrial complex is um, all too trustworthy, but um, to say that that was the tax framework that I could work with. Um, and, and also that there's this, going back to the reflexivity thing of like, who gets to ask these questions and how? 
it, it, I think again and again, it's necessary as we're asking these questions about um, inequity and histories of inequity and like microbes that we also create structures that kind of transcend me being the one to ask this question um, mm. and really just uh, sort of trouble the uh, the kind of status quo of academia is where these get asked. Mm. Um, like I think that academia has done very um, mixed things um, to to further people's um, agency, safety, health, and rights. Um, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But like to monopolize knowledge production, I think is a problem. And so creating alternative institutions feels like an appropriate move. Um, and I think there was another question up here. Um, <clears throat> I think critical ecology is much about is as much about science as it is about advocacy. Mm -hmm. And I was curious what, you know, in 10, 15 years, what you see the lab turning into mm -hmm. and how and kind of this idea of like if Dr. Pierre was the Secretary General of the UN, what is like one policy? So that things she will have failed employ. if that happens. <laughs> we will have had backfire. Um, <laughs> I was the secretary, so don't let that happen. Um, uh, I think I don't have like a full answer. I think seeing institutions like the People's Forum is this reminder that like growth and resources exist and they're available and it, and it prompts me to dream bigger. Um, for those who don't know, like we don't have a building, we don't have a lab. I It is a 1.5 human operation with a lot of student volunteers and faculty collaborators, but I am most of the staff. <laughs> and um, we don't have, um, yeah, all of these kind of infrastructural things that would make it possible to do this work uh, with the full rigor that I want to. Um, but by showing up in these spaces, I guess I'm trying to to ask for that in a way. Um, and the vision that I have is goes back to this question or um, issue that I mentioned earlier of like what, uh, besides this scientific activity, what is the point? Like what is the advocacy actually? Is it activism? Is it asking for policy change? I'm actually not going to be a political activist in the same way that um, people who are, you know, intellectually and values aligned with me will be. What I can do is create all of the the knowledge tools and the remember that coherent narrative that I mentioned that I think is absent in how we talk about the environment. Like mm -hmm. I want to fundamentally change how the president is talking about environmental change. Like. That's, I don't wanna be the president. I wanna make sure that that person fundamentally understands the environment differently and irrefutably. And so if I, if that means taking science um, that we do in the lab and that people who are doing critical ecology in other places, taking that science, taking those data and making them stories and grounding those stories in uh, our, his, our shared histories, mm -hmm. right? Like going into, for example, this this question about the plantation scape and merging what I find with conversations about reparations, which are which are emerging emerging globally right now, where colonial governments like uh, I think England or the Church of England, Anglican Church, just had like an announcement where they're like, mm -hmm. "We'll kick you a hundred million dollars." I'm like, that is embarrassing. That's not a not that's not even close to what you made off of slavery, but if if my work can be helped to do an accurate accounting of what is truly owed and what structurally has to change, that's that's kind of the goal. So I imagine, um, you know, say, let's say 20 years from now when I'm, wow, that's so creepy to think about. Um, but 20 years from now, um, we, have our laboratory and we have a network of laboratories that work with us because having centralized having centralized science is part of the problem and mm -hmm. having this kind of coveted you know protective um idea of like i have to come out with the the um results first and be the one who discovered it this is the problem mm -hmm. that we restructure that entirely so that these the our findings are constantly coming out and are are discursive 
that would be a win. Mm. And having that connected to a media arm that is mm. producing narratives um, coherently and in different formats um, for different audiences that makes people feel less disconnected from science and really f makes people feel um, like, oh, I kind of felt this in my bones all along, hmm. but here it is very clear. And now I'm so emboldened that I'm actually going to make demands of my government. That will be a win. That's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Mm. Uh, thank you so much again, Dr. Pierre. Um, I know that like working in personal spaces that people treat as like abstract ideas can be challenging oh, yeah. um, and it demands a lot, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and your, your question was actually one of mine, so it allowed me to ask, uh, who are the co-conspirators that you need to transform mm. these dreams into realities and what can we do? There are a lot of us sitting in this room right mm. now, and we are all Thank people you. with power, mm. and Thank we can make decisions that. to do things. So what can we do? Thank you so much for asking that, and I wish I were better prepared uh, oh. for that awesome question. Um, I think some of the some of the co-conspirators, so, so I had basically, these questions are being answered for me as, I, as I, I've been fortunate to have different people from different areas approach me and say like, oh, like, you know, I have these resources and it, and I'm just, I'm literally just like this person who like does science and I have to now like think about, um, yeah, just, just strategy in a way that I haven't before. And so it's a really good question. But one of the things that I'm learning is um, that I need people who have skills that are useful outside of science, but also maybe un unknown to them are useful in science. Mm -hmm. Storytellers, um, people who, and, and storytellers is, is a very broad category intentionally, um, people who are, who have access to land. Um, this is something that um, is, is what I'm, I'm dealing with in the study with St. Croix, that so much of the land that was once, plant, once plantation land is private. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of people are very distrustful of s people snooping around about slavery. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to yell at you guys, just I need to get some soil cores. <laughs> and, and so there's this kind of access to like actual capital of like land and also space. Like right now, I mean, when I say this is a scrappy operation, my God, um, we are only able to do the like benchtop science of, you know, extracting DNA from soil because someone who has a lab that's set up for that mm. is it has said um, I'm going to be one kind of arm of of your of the body that makes up your lab so if you know people who have these types of resources or are interested in having conversations with me about that um, there's that and then I think and and this is the thing that I'm, I know the least about but I'm trying to learn um, is like I don't actually know how money works super well. Um, <laughs> what I mean by that is um, when it comes to actually operating a university, the reason that, op that universities can operate as they do is because they have the endowments from slavery. Like that's not a metaphor. That's actually how they are able to sustain themselves. Those endowments that came from um, land-based wealth, which is derived from enslavement, and sometimes from the actual ownership of people, um, shout out Princeton University, mm -hmm. um, get invested. And those investments, the returns on investments are what pay professors, um, in addition to donations and, and so forth. Um, grants and stuff like that are, this. now I'm going on a tangent, but like people think that like universities are, are run off of grants, but they are in a very like limited fraction and the vast majority of what keeps the lights on and like have them having their own power plants on site mm -hmm. is this wealth, this really old wealth. Um, and so uh, it's really hard to wrap my head around how someone like me who is not, uh, who does not have the same social capital as someone who could go to an investment firm and say like, you should, you should invest in my building. Mm -hmm. You should buy me this building. Like, 
that's uh, that's something that I've been wrestling with. That I don't really know how to make this work when I am not that person. Um, and I think this is how movements stay small: is they're just being this barrier um, that I'm I'm doing all I can to kind of learn about and and kind of transcend. But um, yeah, talk to me about. Um, uh, large donations. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a hand back there. And, so, and also, yeah. but th th there might be questions from online. I don't know if they've been... No? It's getting hot. Okay. Was... Thank you. Hi, Um you were talking about like doing uh, doing some work, bridge, like trying to bridge the gap between academic and non-academic, and like getting communities together. Mm -hmm. I'm just really curious what your experiences are and difficulties have been with that, because I can imagine that is, uh, yeah. Very very uh, good point. Are we good on time though, Sadie? Got about a couple more minutes. Okay, okay for sure. Um, so um, I think the question about whether I've had any pushback um, with relating to communities um, that I'm trying to not only like, so there's this framework I think that, or like it's tendency in science to be like, we're gonna have some broader impacts and we'll write them at the very end of the grant. Mm -hmm. And that means that we'll go to an elementary school and do one lesson about this whole project that took 10 years um, and we're done. Um, and that, uh, that model and, and kind of like way that science has chosen um, and valorized interactions with um, those outside of academia um, is part of what creates this distrust contemporarily, in addition to long histories of distrust of science, of course, in, in the ways that science has used um, communities of color largely and, and poor working class people as kind of the space to test out questions um, and, and often um, with no like crediting or, or um, yeah, consent. So um, just want to acknowledge like the background of your question and then say that that has manifested um, in uh, when I approach community organizations saying like, hey, um, I'm a young black woman and I do science. There's almost like an immediate like, okay, like backing away. Um, I think it would be a running away if I was like, a white man saying that mm. um, because I think not because there's um, people understand that there's potentially something to gain from partnering with people in science, but the risk is so high that it makes that gain almost um, um, negative or neutral. And so, so yeah, so there's definitely reluctance because there's this assumption of you're just going to collect data about us and we'll never see you again. And you probably will not include us in the process of doing this project. Um, and I get that. And so I think that's why I, I have um, this, this model that I was referring to from the other, the other question of what if we didn't come with a hypothesis? What if we were just like, I know stuff, you also know stuff. Um, would you like to have a chat? Here's some more derves. And then you get this sense of, okay, well, we come out with a list of ideas and they're not from the scientist, but the scientist knows how to parlay that into um, a question that is legible to other academics and the government. Um, and if people see us stick with that, that we actually go, here it is as a hypothesis. And then we do a thing where we go, also, we're gonna invest in your community by saying, we're gonna teach a lesson about hypothesis generation to kids, right? Like we want your the youth of this community to have a new skill set that might be useful to them in the future while we also deploy some of these questions um it's this kind of i think like hopefully a recursive trust building exercise um that also comes out with fundamentally new scientific understandings And I think probably we're at the last question, but um, there's one more question that far back. Mm. Mine is more of bringing back the previous thing that we, that you like tabled, that we tabled before, because you like said some comments and I, 
thought about them <laughs> in oh, relation good. to that <laughs> concept. Yeah, and nice. I uh, <laughs> wanted to like mention kind of what they were, and it was around relating like black women bodies under capitalism and other forms of oppression and the environment, right? Like, but thinking about them in terms of like externalities mm -hmm. under knowledge production in capitalism, right? Like, and you just said in the example of these communities experience harm in knowledge production of scientific knowledge production mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then they're then are forgotten yeah. and i i before i what came to mind was you know the development of gynecology as a subject right like and mm -hmm. harm absolutely yeah, to black women in particular mm -hmm. in the development mm -hmm. of gynecology yeah. and then thinking about like cold spring harbor as the development of molecular biology mm -hmm. and then all around cold spring harbor is waste heavy metal waste and this mm -hmm. absolute like devastation of the environment so like I think that, for, yeah, the, I just wanted to like note, like, yeah, your framework makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Here are some thoughts that you had. I have, yeah, I, I appreciate those kind of closing comments. And like, I, while we were talking, I did think of like, I clarified a little bit to myself um, what, like, what I wanted to link this to. Um, so there's this theorist that maybe some people here already know, um, Dr. Christina Sharp. Um, I believe she's a professor at, um, Tufts University right now. She's a black feminist theorist. Mm -hmm. um, I think she's in the English department. Um, and so she's she's like squarely a theorist, right? But she she talks about, like she's written a bunch of things. One of them talks about um, the, the wake of the transatlantic slavery, of, mm -hmm. of the transatlantic slave trade, excuse me. Um, and the language that she uses, the word wake, and I'm gonna like do like a trash job because it's just so phenomenal in the way that she explains it in probably 200 pages. Um, but she talks about like the wake of tra the transatlantic slave trade as being both a spatial field and a temporal field. That um, and she kind of plays off of this other guy, Fred Moten, that people may also know, another black theorist, who talks about slavery as not being an event that it's a durational field mm. that actually spills out beyond the um, the t you know year to like the starting to emancipation boundaries of time that it actually took place that that spatial and temporal field is larger than that and one of the ways that we can look for the the manifestations of how much larger it is is looking at the experiences of black women long after slavery, right? As this kind of starting node to understand oppression at its sort of, at the lowest valence that it falls to, right? When you when you register um, that black women are sort of the the lowest in society, right? Functionally, and that's part of this, this kind of theory, um, but that we uh, also do this to the environment, that there's, um, these, uh, I think this other guy, I'm just doing this now, sorry y'all, um, this other guy um, who more recently spoke about Hop Hopkins, um, yes, that's his real name, I didn't make that up, <laughs> he spoke about um, these uh, kind of, like, uh, what did he call them? Um, throwaway zones, or, oh, he had just a, a really nice term, it's a, uh, it's kind of this discard area, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so looking for the sites of discard allow us to see the whole of the system better because there is not real, there's no discard site. Um, it, nothing really goes away. We just have to look for where we put it. And often that is registered in the bodies of the least among us. Often that's registered in areas that we don't care about and ecologically. Um, and and uh, I had one more thought. Oh. And also thinking about these, what we think of as events of oppression as actually a, a field of space and time um, also allows us to look for those sites of, um, of refuse, right? Um, I think I'm getting a little too heady for my own good. So um, you're good, you're good. Mm -hmm. on that note, thank you everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah.
y'all just did my job for me. Well, thank y'all so much for coming out. A huge thank you to Dr. Suzanne Pierre and Salvatore thank for hosting you. this wonderful, wonderful um, seminar. And we hope to see you next month for the next one. Take care. Thank, thank you. you very much. And if anybody is interested in capitalism and eco-socialism, it's, it's a journal dedicated to eco-socialism in particular. It's one of a kind in, in academia. So it's free for the taking. Thank you very much. The breadth of knowledge that was just...